I will introduce you to the Chinese culture. So the second topic I want to discuss is the cultural context. When we examine cultural background, we had better begin with Shang culture. Why? One reason is that we do not have much reliable knowledge of Xia culture. The other reason is that Xia culture was not as influential as Shang culture. It is in the Shang dynasty that universal kingship emerged. Okay, now let's come to the details of Shang culture. So at that time, there were barbarian populations living in the heartland of the civilized world and on the periphery. They did not like to accept the common civilization. Some of those people were gradually absorbed in the central place of the civilized world. And their cultures were not less advanced than the civilized world. So, with their joining the world, the common civilization got enriched in cultural content. As a matter of fact, there seemed to be a melting pot cultural world. The area of Lu was the locus of old Zhou classical tradition. And this is the home to Confucianism. The areas of Yan and Qi were homeland of magical or shamanistic modes of thought. The area of Chu was homeland of religious fantasy. It was said to be birthplace of Daoism. And the area of Qin was legalist mode of thought. With much interaction among those cultures, they formed a common civilization in the first millennium BCE. Our knowledge about the Shang culture is mainly from the oracle bone inscriptions. The study of the oracle bone inscriptions have provided lots of insights into religion, political thought, and practice. Social organization, calendrical signs, and etymology of ancient graphs, and so on, so forth. In this course, let us just focus on religion, social, political attitudes, and the interaction between these two areas. By religion, we mean a broad sense of religion, or a rough sense of religion. It is concerned with ancestral spirits, nature gods, and the high god, Shang Di, or just Di. Ancestor worship is pervasive in Chinese civilization. In the oracle bone inscriptions, ancestor worship stands out as the cult of royal clan. The royal cult occupied a central position in the royal urban settlement. The religion of ancestor worship might have been used to provide the foundation of royal legitimacy. Ancestor worship may have contributed to a powerful conception of political order in ancient China. Now, let me try to elaborate on this point. First, ancestor worship is primarily concerned with kinship rather than kingship. Ancestors 
are not spirits who dwell in the mysterious realm of the dead. They are spirits who still maintain some relationship with their living descendants. Together with the living family members, they form a ritual community of family. This community might include those who are yet to be born. Obviously, this is a community that crosses the line of life and death. Within such a community, each family member assumes a different role and form a definite relationship between each other. Here, the relationship of role players is of much formal importance. It defines the ritual community of family. Let me give you an example. In the book of Mozi, we have such an account. I quote, The spirit of a man is not a man, yet the spirit of your elder brother is your elder brother. Sacrificing to a man's spirit is not sacrificing to a man. Sacrificing to your elder brother's spirit is sacrificing to your elder brother. It is clear that what is kept intact across the divide between life and death is not the living man or the dead man, but the kinship status. The ritual sacrifices to ancestors seems to be of much structural significance. It presents a social structure that is centered on kinship. This is a more formal structure, which is concerned with nothing other than familial roles. The religious orientation to ancestor worship simply reflects the extraordinary strength of kinship in ancient Chinese social structure. The living relatives are related to the dead relatives in the ritual community of family. Although the dead dwell in the numinous or mysterious realm, they seem to be no different in ritual sense from the living. Both the dead and the living are the members of the same community. They conform to the norm of kinship. And violation of this norm would receive punishment from ancestors. Ancestors in the numinous realm could confer benefits on descendants. They, they can also inflict woe on descendants who do not abide by the rituals. All of this works depending on the proper ritual behavior of the lineages within the ritual community. The kinship group, as provided by religious orientation of ancestor worship, can be regarded as a paradigm of social order. This is a social network of intimately related familial roles. In the ritual community of family, the role relationships span the divide between the world of the living and the numinous, mysterious world of the dead. From this, we can see a picture of social ontology. We see clearly the ontological reality of role and status. We also see the ontological reality of the order that exists in the ritual community. It is 
a biological or a natural fact that the kin-shaped rows are hierarchical. This shows that hierarchy and row constitute an integral aspect of the social structure. In this picture of social ontology, we do not see a big gap between the normative and the natural aspect of social reality. Social hierarchy and social role are normative notions, but we can come up with a natural sense of those notions when we put ourselves in the ritual community of family. Remember, Quine's predicate inquiry, we find a context and locate a linguistic act in that context. In doing linguistic act, we come up with a sense of ontological commitment. In this case, what we do is a ritual act. This is an extension of linguistic act. Wittgenstein said at the beginning of Tractatus Logical Philosophicus, the world is the totality of facts, not of things. Here we have a question, what are facts? In this context, I would say facts are what we are committed to when we engage ourselves in a specific act. In this case, they are what we are committed to when we engage ourselves in a ritual act like ancestor worship. What is crucial at ancestor worship is role performance of the ancestor spirit rather than the separate life story of the individual spirit within the world of the spirits. The ancestor spirits dwell in the world of the divine or luminous. However, the ancestors of the royal lineage are in direct communication with the high god. The high god bestows heavenly mandate. The king can get heavenly mandate through his ancestor communication with the high god. The heavenly mandate is the guarantee for the political legitimacy. The origin of royal ancestors can be traced to nature spirits. So, the royal ancestors can also be the objects of supplications concerning droughts, floods, and other natural events. Ancestors of ordinary people also possess numinous qualities, mysterious qualities. The line dividing the divine from the human is not sharply drawn. Even some humans may possess or take on qualities which are truly numinous. Those men who have exceptional powers or accomplishments could have their spirits elevated to the status of functional deities. A typical example of this is General Guan Yu of the Three Kingdoms. He has emerged as a popular god of loyalty and wealth. People go to temples to worship him today. So, the relation between the divine numinous realm and the human world appears to be a continuum rather than a separation. There is also a reverse process concerning the relation between the two realms. In China, the legendary figures, the godly figures, may be treated as historic figures. For example, in remote past, Fu Xi, Shen Nong, Yao, Shun, they were legendary figures, 
But later on, they became sage kings in classic Chinese literature. The fact that there is no clear separation of the divine from the human may be used to account for why there is no creation mode of thought in China's religious orientation. It is not that heaven creates human beings, but rather that heaven gives birth to human beings. Now, let me give you an example. This example is from the book of poetry. From this book, we have the following lines. Heaven, in giving birth to the multitudes of the people, to every faculty and relationship annexed is law. The people possess this normal nature, and they consequently love normal virtue. This feature of Chinese religious orientation is strikingly different from other religions. Ancestor worship and its emphasis on kinship in the social order may also have shaped political and military order. In ancient China, people were organized into various sorts of zu. A zu consists of some hundred of households belonging to the same lineage. They were held together by common ancestral cults. Zu, as an organization, can be used for military purpose. It can also be used to mobilize agricultural labor. So, lineage of Zhu works to provide the base of military organization and for agricultural organization. Such lineage groups may have further played a leading role in political organization in pre-dynastic period. This foreshadows later development of Zhou political system. We are going to talk about the details of that later on.